I think so. I think so. Well, they, these two don't need no introduction, y'all. <laughs> no brother Eric. I was looking forward to what God's got Amen. in store for us tonight. So my friend, you come. Amen. 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 Thank you, my brother. Thank you so much. Love you, pal. Amen. Amen. Hey. All righty. Uh, if you will, turn with me to Luke. Luke chapter 14. We're going to uh, read verses 25 through uh, 33. While you're turning there, uh, I don't know how Twisted Sister makes it into this, but they do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, come, they come out with a song called The Price and in 1976 D. Snyder joined this band this band they didn't hit anything um, until like 1984 but for, for those eight years nothing happened nothing happened they just kept they played little music venues in New York but nothing ever happened they never hit it big and as I was reading, the one thing D. Snyder said, he said that through it, though they never made mainstream, but with two songs, the song, The Price, meant something to him because he had to give up so much time away from his wife and his kid. So there was a price to pay with wanting to make a music career. I just want to read... Some of the lyrics. How long I have wanted this dream to come true. And as it approaches, I can't believe I'm through. I've tried, oh, how I've tried. For a life, yes, a life I thought I knew. Oh, it's the price we got to pay and all the games we got to play. Makes me wonder if it's worth it to carry on. Though it's a life we got to choose and the price is our own life until it's done. I think that fits with this tonight. The title of this sermon is The Price for Life. We've heard this sermon several times with preacher, and he preached it to me one night. And I heard it, but I didn't hear it like I hear it tonight. My toes were stepped on through this. So if you would, <clears throat> please stand with me in reading of God's Word. I'm going to be reading out of the NASB, so please follow along carefully. Scripture says... Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all, of, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or, what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, none of you can be my disciples who does not give up all his own possessions. Let us bow our head. Heavenly Father, I just come to you right now to glorify your great name first and foremost because you are worthy of being praised. You are the father of us all. You are the father of creation. God, we adore you. God, I ask that you'll come with us right now. I know the Spirit's here right now, but will you move amongst our hearts right now and prepare it. Open up our ears, our hearts, and our minds so we will receive the word, so we will understand what the cost is for discipleship. God, we, just, we need you. We need you to speak these words, not Eric. So hide me behind the cross of Calvary. And Lord, just come through and speak to my brothers and sisters tonight and give them clear understanding. God, we love you. We thank you. We pray everything in Jesus' name. Amen. 
you may be seated. As we as we look, mine turned. <laughs> um, a little background: uh, Jesus is he's coming. He's in the he's went to the synagogue with the Pharisees. He's, I'm sorry, he's went into the houses of a Pharisee and breaking bread. Uh, he's going to do some healing. Uh, he gives us the parables of the guest, the parable of the great dinner. And then we're here at the discipleship tested, and, and we see large crowds are gathered together. Who are these large crowds? I think that's important that we need to figure out who this is. Who are these large crowds? Well, maybe it's, maybe it's people who, who've never seen Jesus. Maybe it's people who've heard of Jesus and just want to follow him around and see what he's doing. Maybe it's somebody that wants to be healed through his miracles. Maybe, maybe it's just people in surrounding areas that's hurt. Or just maybe it's some who have never heard the gospel, who, who do not understand what it means to follow Christ. Just maybe... And that's why he's given us these verses to tell us, this is what it costs. This is what it takes to follow me. And y'all, I think all of us know, but do we really count the cost? Do we really count the cost in what it means to be a disciple of Christ? I hope tonight that you will see some things that will resonate and, and make you think about it. Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children, brother, sister, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. The first thing that I think we see here is the requirements for discipleship. Jesus doesn't want you to hate your mother, your sister, your wife, your brother. He doesn't want you to hate it. It's what it says. But what Jesus is saying is he wants you to love Christ so much, so much. Hear what I'm saying. He wants you to love him so much that it looks like you hate your family. Come on, man. Amen. You have to love Christ that much to follow him. Does that scare you? When I started reading it, it scared me. I, I, I remember receiving Christ, and, and I don't remember signing up for this. But let me tell you, I'm glad I did sign up for it. We need to love Christ. And I think that's the big thing that's missing in today's time. Is we don't love Jesus. Matter of fact, look in the mirror tonight and ask yourself that question. Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Here you go. Eric, do you love Jesus? I do. How do you love me? I read your Bible. I pray here and there. I think I bet you that sounds like you. Y'all, we got to give more than that. We've got to give so much more than just a little bit. A little bit's not enough. A little bit doesn't, doesn't count what Jesus is saying. We're going to see here in a little bit what Jesus says. What are you giving for Christ? Are you giving your all? He goes on and says that he must hate himself. Now that one, that's some pride right there. You have to get rid of your pride. Who has pride? I do. I have pride. I get in God's way so much. God, I don't need your help. I got this. No, no. Look what it says next, and this is how you'll know that you have nothing to do. Whoever does not carry his own cross cannot come after me. Cannot, and he cannot be my disciple. You have to take your cross up daily. That means you've got to get rid of yourself. You have to have self-denial. Get rid of the pride, hey. God, maybe, maybe this. Maybe if you, you pray in the morning, maybe what you need to think about is this. God, let me die to myself today so I can take your cross 
and go throughout this land sharing Jesus. You have to deny yourself. Take your cross up daily to do the will of God. (laughs) Y'all, I'm telling you, I heard preacher preach this. I heard it. But tonight is something different. It's different. It means something different when you go to Scripture and you read it. When you let it resonate in your heart. When you let it go deep down. It changes you. Let the Word of God change you each and every day. Take your cross up daily and follow God. It's part of the requirements. It is part of the requirements to follow God. And it's not hard. We make it hard. The next thing we see, here, let me read this. You should love Christ so much that it looks as if you hate your family. I want to reiterate that one more time and make sure that you hear that. Love Christ so much. Here, my wife and kid is here. Abigail's not. I love them too. With all my heart. With everything I got. But I love Christ more. I promise you, I love Christ more. And to prove it, I'm not bragging on me, but I listened to God's call upon my life and He sent me to Fruitland. Not by my choice, by His choice. They were second and third. Christ is number one and must be. (coughs) Excuse me. Let me get a drink of water real quick. Go to verse 28. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? I thought about my dear brother Brad. And if you don't mind, I'd like to use you. Brad's going to build something for the church. Brad comes out and he estimates it. Let's just say it's going to cost $10,000, he says. And he starts building it. And all he gets is the foundation done. Has Brad counted the cost? No, he's not. Guess what he's done? He's made himself look bad. Uh, uh, He's ruined his name. Because what are people going to think about Brad? Old school craftsmanship, if they don't do a good job, if they say, well, this is what it's going to cost, they run out of money within the first two weeks, and the job is never finished. What happens? It's the same thing for a Christian. When you accept Christ, you accept Christ. You didn't accept Christ to quit on him. You accepted him to go forward. Now, for the Internet people, Brad does not do bad work. He does great work. I don't want to give him a bad rep. But think about that. If Brad doesn't count the cost for everything, materials, uh, the tools, his labor, all those things, the brick, the wood, anything, if he does not count the full cost, he's going to fall short. It's the same thing with us as a Christian. Same thing. And it goes on in 29 and says, Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him. As I was just saying, y'all, I thought about the armor of God. The armor of God... It covers you. And I remember five years, four years ago, I was talking to a preacher about it, and I was going to Frank Andonitis' church to, to preach it in front of the teens. And he said, Eric, do you realize that the armor of God has one weakness? I'm like, no, no, no. He said, yes. There's nothing that covers the back. 
as a Christian, you're not allowed to turn around and run away. You, you're in the battle. Forward. Forward, soldier, forever forward. That's the way it is as a Christian. You wasn't called to backpedal. Stand boldly for the Lord. Don't be ashamed of what God has to say. Do not. Stand boldly. Listen, I am proud that I'm a Christian. Is it the hardest thing I've ever done? Absolutely. It was easy living in sin. It was so easy. But to live a life, a Christian life, is so much more demanding. But yet it's way more gratifying. The next thing we see is a battle. Uh, In verse, let's see, after, I'm going to read 29 and go forward again. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000. This one was tough. I admit, this one was hard for me to to wrap my mind around. So let me, I I want to read. If the king with 10,000 men wants to battle, he must first see if he has a chance by checking the terrain, the logistics, his weaponry, and what strategic and tactical advantages he has to to outnumber, I mean, to to go and fight this fight. He has to go and look at all these things to see. And as I thought about that, it makes sense. When we become a Christian, we have to observe everything. We need to observe everything. Because y'all, we in a fight like this. We're probably outnumbered. This particular king was outnumbered two to one. I don't know what the statistics are for us right now, but I bet you it's way more than two to one versus the world versus the Christian. We need to consider everything around us. Granted, we have one thing. We have one thing they don't. And that's the Father above that can get us through anything. He can get us through anything. But we have to depend on Him because He says, if you don't do these things, you cannot be my disciple. Do y'all get what I'm trying to tell y'all tonight? There is a price you have to pay to follow Christ. And it's a great price. But it's a price worth paying. If none of these things are in his favor, you know, let me go on and read. Let me just go read. Uh, or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000, or else, or else. So he has an option. This king has an option. Or else. While the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. You see, if if this king of ten that has ten thousand men doesn't consider everything, it's a suicide mission. It's a suicide mission. And if it's a suicide mission, then he needs to figure out a different way. And peace is the way. He has to send somebody on ahead. Hey, soldier, go. Take this. What can we do to have peace? Now, let's think about these stories together. Both stories are about commitment in following Christ. Jesus does not need emotional driven, self sinking, temporary followers. He needs committed Christians. You hear what I'm saying? Let me read that one more time. 
Jesus needs committed Christians. He doesn't need emotional driven, self seeking, temporary followers. You have to be committed. It's a price for life. For life. Do you get that? If you don't understand what I'm saying, for life means eternity. Eternity in heaven or eternity in hell. It's your choice. It's your choice. You get to choose. I've, I've told Eric Paul, life is full of choices. Everything is a choice. You choose to do something. Brothers and sisters, you choose to serve Christ or you choose not to serve Christ. Verse 33. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. I, I, I entitled this Surrender for Discipleship. Surrender means give up. What are you willing to give up? What are you willing to give up? Stop and think for just a minute while I'm saying this. What are you willing to give up for Christ? Are you willing to give up a pack of cigarettes? Are you willing to give up your phone? Are you willing to give up that TV? What are you willing to give up? Here, here. Let me, let me, let me dig a little deeper. Are you willing to give up your family to follow Christ? Come on, man. Come on, brother. Are you willing? Are you willing to lay down your life for Christ? If that don't kick you in the teeth, you need to reevaluate because all my teeth got knocked out back here in the green room when I read that. I need to lay down my life for Christ. To stand boldly on thus saith the Lord. It's his will, not mine. I want y'all to think about this. Here. Some, some things. John the Baptist, what did he give up? His head. What Peter? What about Peter? He was crucified upside down, right? He was martyred, right? What about Paul? Who was beaten? I, I think I read, if I'm wrong, I'll take the blame for this. I think I read where he was stoned five times. Stoned, y'all. Rocks thrown at him. He was beaten. He was put in prison. And he was put to death by the evil Nero. Now, I'm not sure what that put to death meant, whether it meant beheaded or he was killed. Either way, Paul gave up his life to follow Christ. Right. What are you willing to give up? Come on, brother. Now I'm going to kick you in the teeth and put my foot down your throat. What did Jesus give up? Jesus gave up the right hand, the right seat of the Father. He gave up glory to come to a sinful world, to be born of a virgin, to be ridiculed and mocked, to be beaten, to suffer, then to be nailed to a cross because of our sins. Do you realize something, y'all? Each one of us hung Jesus on the cross Personally, Amen. every one of us, we hung him. But oh, let me tell you something. My Lord come out of the grave on the third day. And because of that, I have a way home one day. Because he died on the cross of Calvary, I have a way home. I'm here to tell y'all right now, there is a cost. There is a cost. And it's a great cost, but it's a worthy cost. Right. I 
I'm not going to say no more. Can you get us some music? Tonight, if God's moving in your heart, and you have some unrepented sin, you have something that's holding you back from calling upon the Almighty God, will you come forward tonight and bow down and ask God to take this from you so you can serve Him in a mighty way? Will you count the cost of what it means to follow Christ tonight?